I'm John Murphy. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture. It's my job to welcome you and thank you for coming. Before I ask Bill to come up and do the introductions, I'm going to ask Ian Kane to come up and tell you a little bit about this speaker series we have and what's up next after tonight. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, on behalf of the entire lecture series uh, committee and my co-chair, uh, Dr. Suat Gunam, I just want to remind you about a couple of upcoming events. Uh, on March 26th, we have Andy Bernheimer. Uh, he's a very prominent architect from New York City. Uh, he has his own firm, which is uh, Andy Bernheimer Design. And he also happens to be the director of the Masters of Architecture program at Parsons, uh, the, the, again, the well-known uh, design program in New York, so we look forward to hearing from Andy, and the title of his lecture is Stories and Buildings. And uh, secondly, on April 9th uh, at 5.30, also in this room, uh, there will be a really important panel discussion. Uh, the uh, speakers will be uh, representatives of six prominent construction firms here in San Antonio, and the topic will be uh, the evolution of construction industry both here in San Antonio and in South Texas. So we look forward to that. And uh, hope we'll see you all here. Both those lectures will be at 5.30 right here in the Southwest Room. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor uh, William DuPont, who I think is going to do the introduction of tonight's speaker. Thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you, Dean Murphy. Uh, welcome to uh, our lecture tonight. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this one because it's, it's kind of a, a special connection uh, that I have as well as Professor Angela Lombardi uh, because we both were able to participate uh, with Lisa Ackerman, our speaker tonight, um, on a project in Iraq. And uh, Lisa will be mentioning a little bit about that, but uh, talking more broadly about the World Monuments Fund. Um, it's, it's special for us because we have our, as you know, uh, Center for Cultural Sustainability here in the College of Architecture. And this is the kind of project that we aim to be involved in when we set up this center uh, a few years ago. Uh, we're very concerned about issues of continuity, heritage, and tradition, and looking at cultural heritage and people as a key component of sustainability. And it's not just the science of buildings and the performance, that's very important, but it's also about people and their traditions and their beliefs and the continuity from the past into the future. And so this was a fabulous opportunity um, to work in Iraq and to be engaged in a training program with the World Monuments Fund uh, that we were able to seize. Uh, and that's because the university here, UTSA, has as its uh, one of its core objectives, in addition to the ones that they state on the website, to be bold and to uh, take advantage of opportunities when they come before you. And so when we were given this opportunity to respond to the World Monuments Fund, and Angela and I committed to do it, we needed the support and collaboration of many uh, personnel within the university in order to uh, proceed as quickly as we needed to do to get our approvals because as you know, Iraq is a, is a war zone uh, and our insurance policy didn't uh, want us to go there. And so a lot of uh, special uh, work had to be done by many individuals in the administration and it required the full support of the leadership of the university and our college in order to be able to do it. So we're very grateful to be working at a place like UTSA uh, where uh, people will take advantage of an opportunity that we had and make it possible for us to do our work and collaborate with an institution such as the World Monuments Fund on a project like that. So, now I want to uh, just mention Lisa and say a few words about her before um, she begins. Uh, I've known her for many years. Uh, we've worked together uh, as board members on a, a group called the U.S. Uh, International Council on Monuments and Sites, which is often referred to as ECOMOS or ICOMOS, depending on how you choose to pronounce it. And this group has a, a mission to support uh, World Heritage and to help uh, the World Heritage Committee in making their selection of World Heritage sites and to uh, oversee and support uh, the uh, objectives of, of the World Heritage designation. 
and, and having that list of inscribed sites. And it's a collaborative group of about 8,000 professionals internationally. And so we're both able to serve on that U.S. National Committee and have done so uh, together for many years, and it's been very rewarding to, to work with Lisa. And uh, prior to her work at the World Monuments Fund, she was with the Crest Foundation, and this took her to many places all over the world, and it took her to, even to San Antonio at one point uh, earlier in her career. Uh, so it was a fabulous job that she had, and she left it for another fabulous job to be involved with the World Monuments Fund and all their programs that she's about to tell you about. Um, but she's in a great leadership position, and uh, I think she has one of the greatest uh, jobs in the world uh, as for somebody like me. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very envious of all the things that she gets to do and the, and the programs that she gets to be involved in that you're about to hear about. So I think we should have Lisa up here now to talk, uh, and uh, please welcome Lisa Ackerman. Um, thank you very much, Phil, and uh, I'll remember those envious words of yours when I've got 425 unanswered emails that I have to deal with. But um, I have had a fabulous career, and it's been really an extraordinary thing that I studied art history as an undergraduate and Italian and French, and I somehow managed to forge a career out of that, um, even though there are many days where I think my only skill is that I can type very fast. But, um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here, and, um, and I started my day with a wonderful walk along the Riverwalk and through um, the King William neighborhood, and a reminder that heritage is really all around us every day, and it's really about learning to look and absorb that information and remember that it really every place we go has something special to tell us. Um, World Monuments Fund started in 1965. It was founded by a man named Colonel James Gray, who was a retired U.S. Army officer. Uh, he was an engineer by training, and he was um, stationed in Italy and part of the post-war reconstruction team. And, and his retirement, he chose to stay in Italy. Um, he did not take well to retirement, and so before you knew it, he was founding a nonprofit organization then called International Fund for Monuments, and he was living in the Veneto region in the north of Italy when the floods of 1966 hit. And so this is an iconic image of what the floods looked like in Venice in 1966, and Jim Gray and many other people really bonded together and mostly at the time were concerned about raising money to restore the buildings damaged as a result of the flooding. But I think uh, Jim Gray was somebody whose mind was always thinking about long-term solutions. And so one of the things that he did in addition, um, we did launch a number of projects, and these are, uh, this is an image of one of the churches in Venice. We ultimately worked on about 30 projects in Venice, um, all these beautiful interiors of the Venetian Renaissance and Baroque that are so iconic. But more importantly, I think what he was really concerned about was what were the lessons that needed to be learned about the floods and what were real solutions that could be tackled. And restoring buildings was great and an important thing to do. But ultimately, um, with World Monuments Fund, my former employer, the Crest Foundation, and UNESCO, this laboratory was set up in Venice called the Misericordia Lab, and it still exists today as a major research center for stone conservation uh, and a center of scholarship and publication. And I think that as important as those restoration projects were, setting up this lab, which looks um, you know, quaint by today's standards, but you know, in the early 1970s when this lab was being set up, it really was an extraordinary opportunity to enhance the ability of the field to tackle the problems. I think one other thing um, that was unusual about World Monuments Fund work in the 1960s and 70s in Venice was um, Jim Gray wrote a newsletter that went out to all of the donors. Um, and, you know, he actually took a very active interest in the Jewish ghetto. And today, it's one of the major sources of Jewish heritage tourism around the world. And millions of visitors specifically go to see the buildings in the Jewish ghetto. And this is what this looked like um, in the late 60s. And then here is what it looked like after 20 years of restoration efforts. And I think that it was very prescient of him because he didn't have a specific interest in Jewish heritage, but he recognized it as one of the defining characteristics of 
the Venetian experience. And um, they took a very active interest in helping to establish not just a conservation program, but the tourism and interpretive program. Venice makes me think about something WMF did 20 years later, which was the response to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. In Venice, in the 1960s, um, and then the 70s, because there was another flood in 72, all of the pictures are of the buildings. And all of the discussion is about the treasures that will be lost. There is really no discussion of what happened to the Venetian population, which obviously was disrupted. But the world really changed, and I was struck um, when I first heard the coverage um, of New Orleans, I couldn't believe the number of times journalists referenced people and really talked about the impact on the population, but talked about it in heritage terms, which was really an extraordinary change in the way we talk about disasters and the way we talk about heritage, because people who'd never heard of the Holy Cross neighborhood or the Lower Ninth Ward were suddenly having discussions about what was happening in New Orleans. And they weren't just happening in the heritage community, everybody was discussing it. And I think World Monuments Fund response to Hurricane Katrina echoes that because we didn't initially go down and restore an iconic building the way we did in Venice. Um, we actually restored this church, um, but restored it so it could be set up as a sort of go-to center for what to do with your historic property. And so this became a beacon in the community for people who were struggling to figure out what to do with their historic homes in that very neighborhood. And it became almost a, a kind of um, community center SWAT team because people would come in and people would literally say, well, let me just walk down the block with you and let's look at it. So I'm you know, both proud that World Monuments Fund was part of that, but I'm also proud of the field that I think was beginning to talk about what heritage is in less precious terms and not that art history isn't important and not that artistic values aren't still important, but a recognition that heritage is more than just famous architects and um, beautiful buildings. <coughs> I want to go back to the 1960s a second. The first three projects of World Monuments Fund were Venice, Lalibela in Ethiopia, and a project in Easter Island. And before I talk about Lalibela, I'm going to say a few words about Easter Island. So this was a one-person organization, a man theoretically in retirement, and he was already working. Um, on three continents. And um, the Easter Island project was very interesting because Venice was all about disaster recovery and um, straightforward conservation activities. Lali Bella we'll talk about in a minute, but Easter Island was all about advocacy. There was a plan to build a refueling and landing strip that would have essentially cut across the entire island. And um, we've all seen those iconic images of the Moai standing in, on Easter Island and the mystery of what Easter Island is. But the extraordinary thing that one man decided he was going to battle these forces. And, uh, and you know, in the end, we all know that there was no refueling and landing strip built there. But the extraordinary efforts he went to raise international consciousness, and he did something that we would never sanction today, but he actually managed to figure out how to get a Moai transferred from Easter Island to Park Avenue in New York City, and it sat in front of the Seagram's building, and it made the front page of the New York Times. And you know, the fact that he just didn't even think that was an impossibility to just make that happen. And I like to think that we've inherited Jim Gray's spirit in that sense, that we, ta we tackle difficult problems. And certainly, when I talk about Iraq, you'll see that we don't shrink away from challenges. But um, Lali Bella, I think, also represents something that became a fundamental principle of WMF, which was local engagement. So the churches of Lali Bella um, were built in the Middle Ages. They were built as a pilgrimage site, um, often referred to as a New Jerusalem in the sense that it really was meant to be a place for holy pilgrimage because it was not clear you were going to be able to go to the Holy Land in that era. Um, it remains the most holy site in um, Ethiopia today. It's a major center of um, what's now called Ethiopian Orthodoxy, but started out essentially as an Eastern Orthodox community. These churches are extraordinary in this landscape. Um, and in the 1970s, when World Monuments Fund became involved, there were a lot of worries about 
the conditions. They're carved into live rock, so they're not quarried stone and brought someplace. These are just carved out um, of the rock that's there. So they're extraordinary. And they're iconic. Many people who've never been to Ethiopia can recognize this landscape. And we began a project that ultimately um, several hundred Ethiopians worked with the small group of Italian conservators that were there. They worked until the political unrest was such that they had to leave the country in the mid-1970s. But I think, interestingly, the work came together as a partnership between um, the patronage of one of the royal family members Ethiopian Airlines that contributed money to it. And then Jim Gray went to the U.S. Embassy and said, you've got a bilateral agreement between Ethiopia and the U.S. government that has to do with funding for certain activities, and you should siphon some of that money off and contribute because this is going to help build capacity in the country. And again, extraordinarily so, he managed to convince them. So right from the start, this was a partnership between the Ethiopian authorities, the airlines, WMF, and um, the American government. So it was really quite an extraordinary feat in those days to put this kind of funding package together. And yet it's something that we do very routinely today. We worked, as I said, until political unrest forced us to leave. In the early 2000s, um, in partnership with UNESCO, we came back to Lalibela. This is another site, this is not another one of the churches from the 1970s. Again, you know, they're just carved. These are freestanding buildings that you can walk into, but carved right into the rock. So why did we go back in the early 2000s? We went back in the early 2000s because the EU awarded um, tens of millions of dollars to the Ethiopian government for advancement of heritage and tourism at Lalibela with the stipulation that these protective covers go on over the churches. And I'm going to go back for one moment to just remind you of how extraordinary it is to come upon this landscape, but how very different it is when these beautiful churches are encased um, in boxes that really mar your ability both to worship in them and to visit them as a tourist. And the reason UNESCO and World Monuments Fund got involved was because there was a complete misunderstanding of what the conservation challenge was. So they put these protective roof beams over them because they said they needed to be protected from water infiltration. And, but they were thinking water falling from the sky. But that is not at all what the problem is. The water is coming from the ground, and it's groundwater penetration that's being brought up by a capillary action into the building walls themselves. So putting these protective covers over not only doesn't solve the problem, it probably exacerbates it because it puts additional weight onto the surrounding landscape. And so we and UNESCO worked very hard to try and make the case that, you know, this was a good instinct to protect the churches, but the wrong solution. In the end, we were only able to get them to stop putting them on more churches. So they're on six of the churches. And another example of um, you know, the issue that when you would have normally come across this in the landscape and had this you know, really breathtaking experience, and now you've got a barrier between you and the church. And so we've been working on one of the churches for several years mostly doing research, and we brought in a firm um, from Italy who came and did a lot of very extensive geotechnical surveys to try and understand how much the rock is moving, how much water really gets absorbed, and we're just now beginning to start the actual conservation of one of the buildings as a demonstration that the water really needs to be solved from the ground, not from above. So that's brought us back to Ethiopia, but we wanted to really embrace the idea that this was about local engagement and not a lot of foreigners coming in and telling people what to do. So we were working on all these surveys for several years that largely were Europeans coming. In the second phase of the project, which we started in 2012, we actually reached out to both the church community in Lalibela and the academic community in Addis and put together a team of 20 trainees who worked with us in several workshops so that people who were going into the construction industry and the conservation field in Ethiopia could actually work on one of these iconic sites. And so, you know, we're really pleased that 
we're helping for a long-term stewardship solution because several of these people actually work for the church authorities as groundskeepers, so it's important for them to understand what the maintenance issues are. So, um, you know, World Monuments Fund has worked on um, about 600 projects in 90 countries since it began, so it's hard to pull together, you know, a selection to give you a flavor of what we do. But since um, Bill DuPont and Angela Lombardi were working with us on this project in Iraq, I wanted to talk a little bit about how did we get from conservation activities and some advocacy into really this issue of post-conflict heritage activities. And the starting point for us probably was the 1980s when a man named Dinu Jurescu left Romania and came to the United States met Bonnie Burnham, who's our president, and Marilyn Perry, who was then the chairman of World Monuments Fund, and talked eloquently about what was happening in Romania, where entire towns were simply being bulldozed. And the concept of private ownership of historic properties was considered anathema to the social um, forces at play under the Ceausescu government. And so Dinu actually watched his several hundred year old family home be bulldozed. And, um, and, that, and as an art historian, the profound effect it had on him, not just to see his home go away, but literally to see markers on roads simply be taken down because the towns don't exist anymore. And you know, we often think of conflict as armed conflict, but heritage can be assaulted in so many ways. And I think the experience in Romania shows that with systematic efforts, you can undo the entire cultural heritage um, of a country or a group of people living within that country. And so there was little to do at the time, but we published this book, The Raising of Romania's Past, which was really an opportunity to put this out in front of the world as something that was um, as profound as what would come a few years later, which was, um, the shelling of Dubrovnik and the outbreak of war in the former Yugoslavia. And there too, WMF um, did work on some post-conflict conservation projects, but most importantly, WMF and many other people in the field recognized that it was an example that even conventions that are in place, such as the 1954 Hague Convention, become nothing more than words on a page because the Yugoslavian population very dutifully put out the blue shield banners to indicate that these were sites meant to be protected in times of armed conflict, and instead they simply became the targets, and those were the very buildings that were being shelled. So as quickly as the banners went up, they really had to come down. And I think that we see what's playing out in Syria today, and there's been a lot of invocation of what does the Hague Convention do when the conflict is civil. But, you know, I really just wanted to give a sense that these are regrettably long-standing problems that we don't seem to solve. But, um, you know, we do try and get smarter and smarter about documenting our heritage in peaceful times and trying to make the case that this is really something relevant to all of us every day. So, in 1989, WMF was invited by the then transitional Cambodian government to come and do an assessment um, at Angkor. And much had been talked about uh, in the years following the Khmer Rouge period about what was the state of Angkor. And, um, you know, there was a belief that the temples had really suffered during that period, but it was actually quite the opposite. The Khmer Rouge took Angkor as their symbol. And while there was certainly no maintenance going on at the site, and the jungle encroached ever more, there was no active um, attempt to in any way harm the cultural heritage of the Khmer Kingdom. And in fact, interestingly enough, the only country that has a cultural icon on its flag is Cambodia, and that's Angkor Wat. And interestingly enough, from the time it was a French protectorate in the 19th century to this very day, the only time Angkor Wat was not on the Cambodian flag was when it was under the administration of the UN in the post-Khmer period. So just an interesting sense of how important the cultural heritage of the Khmer Kingdom is to modern day Cambodia. So even though there was no specific attempt to harm the vast 
complexes of temples in Angkor, it was unfortunately the most heavily mined country ever. And this actually presented a barrier to starting conservation activities because indeed, while nothing had happened at the temples, the area surrounding them was very heavily mined. So in those early days of WMF missions, um, you couldn't go in unless you had a military escort. And you know, you really had to make sure you were staying behind um, the demining teams. The other great assault, and again, we're reading about this in the papers today um, with what continues to go on in Iraq, the war in Syria, the civil unrest in um, Egypt, was tremendous looting. And the looting was not even subtle. And this was taken by my colleague, John Stubbs, who's now teaching at um, Tulane University, but was the longtime program director at WMF. And this he um, took at a shop in Bangkok, and these are items that were clearly stolen from Angkor. And he could have taken hundreds of these shots in that era. Um, virtually every time he went to Asia, he encountered um, pieces that were clearly stolen recently. And there's been some recent cases that have made the news with the Metropolitan Museum of Art having to give back to sculptures that were known to come from a site called Kokair in Cambodia. And there have been some other sales at Christie's and Sotheby's blocked in recent years because of the fear that they are unwittingly trafficking in stolen art. So while the temples were left somewhat unharmed, the sculptural campaigns that decorate them were certainly assaulted in the post-Khmer Rouge period. So um, we began, much like we're doing in Iraq, we began a program in 1991-92 to develop a training program in collaboration with the Cambodian government because the Khmer Rouge really had succeeded in decimating the educated community in Cambodia. And there simply were no people qualified to tackle the conservation issues. So um, this is uh, Angkor Wat on the uh, right. <laughs> and um, and then the, uh, the upper picture is actually sitting on top of the roof of the churning of the Sea of Milk Gallery, so here. And, um, and we began with a project at a temple called Praya Khan. And we began with a concept that we were really not worried about conserving anything too quickly. It was really about training. And so we started with a group of people um, who were recently graduated from Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh. And we had a very small um, international team that served as their instructors. And from that group of 20, many of them stayed with us for more than a decade. And indeed, one woman who was in that original training group named Polly Kiam is actually now our forewoman and the senior conservation architect of the entire project. We actually now employ 120 Cambodian professionals year round full time. And with the exception of some consultants who come for the equivalent of about four or five weeks out of the year, the projects now are all completely run by Cambodians. And, um, and that's something that we really feel was a goal of this project, was to empower the Cambodians to care for their own cultural heritage. Um, the Churning of the Sea of Milk Gallery um, houses um, the largest bas relief um, in Asia and perhaps in the world. Um, it takes about 10 minutes to walk end to end, and it's the depiction of the creation myth in Khmer culture. And it's really an extremely revered place in Cambodia. So while much is made of the million and a half to two million tourists a year who go to visit Angkor, indeed about 500,000 Cambodians um, including Buddhist monks, come to the site regularly. And this is really an important part of um, local veneration of the site. One of the problems um, that Angkor faces is now being loved a little too much. And um, this is at Phnom Bacain, another WMF site. Um, it's the oldest temple in the Angkor Archaeological Park, and it's up at the top of a hill, the only hill in the entire area. And um, thousands of people come to watch sunset fall over Angkor Wat from this spot. And so it's now um, gone from being a post-conflict site 25 years ago 
to being one now that really needs to figure out how to manage tourism effectively. And the tourism is an important part of the Cambodian economy. And the tourists aren't really doing anything wrong. But now it's a question of you've got 40 temples in the uh, Angkor Archaeological Park, and most people only visit five or six. So how do you spread the tourists out more? And how do you convince them that um, you can go to Phnom Bikane other times of the day? Because from 8 in the morning till 3, there's maybe 10 people. And then from 3 p.m. until the end of sunset, there's as many as two or 3,000. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a conundrum, and Apsara National Authority, who's charged with this, is certainly trying to figure out effective tools. Um, but it's, you know, they've gone from being, you know, a place in the jungle that not many people visited to now really having to cope with um, a new tourism strategy. And um, last year, we had a celebration for everybody who'd worked for WMF for more than 10 years. And so the, everybody in this picture, um, many of them have worked for WMF for 20 years, um, but we really wanted to have a celebration and um, we had reached a sort of ending of one phase of work. And so Polly is actually the woman in the um, black skirt and blue sweater um, at the bottom. And, um, and you know, we're really enormously grateful that Polly has stayed with us all these years. So that is a little prelude to how on earth did we get involved in a project in Iraq. Um, after the US-led invasion, um, there was much made of the failure to protect cultural heritage sites. And um, there was obviously a lot of press coverage of the fact that the Baghdad Museum was looted so terribly, and there was looting all over the country at archaeological sites. And the issue at Babylon was that the US and Polish armies had encamped at the site. And you know, for many of us, it's unthinkable. How could you get to one of the world's most famous archaeological sites and decide this was a great place um, to set up an army base? In fairness to those people who make those decisions, when they looked at a map, you know, what they saw was an unbelievably modern, perfect road that went from Babylon to Baghdad. Uh, they saw uh, a helipad, they saw a landing strip, and they saw a conference center, all that had been built by Saddam Hussein. So there was a tremendous amount of resources at the site. Now, you know, we all start, still might say, but didn't they see that archaeological site just on the other side of that conference center? But, you know, from a military standpoint, they had found a place that made sense. And while the US military didn't do the site any good, what we learned after we got involved was that many of the greatest needs at the site really had nothing to do with the military having been there. And that there was years and years of deferred maintenance. There were years of um, reconstructions at the site um, made with unsympathetic materials that were now failing. There were water issues at the site, which is the lament at every archaeological site. And so we were asked by the State Board of Antiquities and Heritage um, in the mid-2000s to help them develop a site management plan for Babylon because more than anything else, they wanted to see um, Babylon inscribed on the World Heritage List and it had been turned down twice. And it had been turned down because they had gone for archeological authenticity and the World Heritage Committee came back and said with all of these reconstructions, you know, we don't feel it meets the criteria for authenticity. Now, many of us who've spent time at archaeological sites might argue there's really no more reconstruction at Babylon than there is at many other sites. But I think that there was an overall feeling that there was a lack of documentation for how the reconstructions had been orchestrated. So we began um, a research phase and an archival phase. And then in 2009, we were finally able to get onto the site. And so um, the first phase on site was extensive documentation of existing conditions. Um, these are some of the um, cold away images from about uh, 1900, 1910, showing what the site looked like when they excavated. And then um, one of our greatest realizations was that there'd just been no site maintenance done for a decade. And so much of the water was coming because vegetation was coming right up to the foundations of the building. 
So we actually spent a year hiring local workers um, simply to go in and clear away the vegetation under the supervision of the State Board of Antiquities personnel. Then another realization, um, there turned out to be no really good maps of Babylon. So there were decades of maps that had been produced, but when you tried to geo-reference them or layer them, you never could find two points that met. We also discovered there was no site boundary for Babylon. So we spent almost all of 2010 and 2011 simply going out with handheld GPS devices and State Board of Antiquities personnel and taking GPS points to plot out a site boundary. And I'm showing you one map, but we actually created 20 different maps, each one with a different theme. So we showed the archeological zone, we showed land use, uh, we showed flora and fauna, we showed military occupation because the military left debris on the site, things like guard towers and razor wire. Um, we showed one that shows all the reconstructions. And so the State Board of Antiquities now has a very sophisticated layered GIS map so that they can look at everything on the site and then pull away different pieces, hopefully that will help set priorities for the future, but also when tourism returns, hopefully will help plot out ways in which people can enjoy the site. So um, a bit like Lolly Vela, um, water is just um, you know, the most unfortunate uh, thing that can happen to, particularly in this case, a mud brick site. So here, what we discovered was there was water that was not being shed properly because in the 70s and 80s, cement parapets were put up at the top of many of these buildings, and so the water was just pouring down. Then we also discovered that from the bottom, water was being drawn up into the mud bricks. And it took a while to figure out what the source of that water was, but it turned out that sometime in the 1980s, there'd been a lot of pathways created throughout the whole site. And so the whole area around many of these buildings had been raised with cement pavers, and then water was simply coming off of the pavers being pushed right towards the building. So last year, one of the projects, believe it or not, was simply pulling up all of the cement pavers and getting the ground level back to where it belongs and then pitching it away to pr protect it. But that's why, you know, as easy as it was for many people to blame the U.S. military, in fact, this kind of damage had nothing to do with the occupation of the site. So, um, you know, famous site, the State Board of Antiquities wants World Heritage designation for it, and what happens in 2012? But the oil ministry says that new pipeline beautifully can traverse the archeological site. There's no problem at all. And they declared there to be nothing relevant in that part of the site and simply put the pipeline down. And so Iraq remains a place where as important as these sites are and as much as the central government wants World Heritage designation, individual agencies can still come along and assault the site in a variety of ways. When I talked about the Saddam Hussein interventions and their impact on the um, you know, issue about authenticity of the site, so you'll see um, on the one slide what the Greek theater looked like when it was first excavated by Robert Coldway and the German Oriental Society, and then what it looked like in the 1980s was a, as an aspect of the Babylon Festival, which was an annual activity that thousands of people came to, they built the theater up to be a venue um, for events associated with that festival. So um, when we first got into this project, we were very focused on the archeological core, very focused on things like the Ishtar Temple and um, you know, the sort of famous image of the processional way. The more we worked with the Iraqis, the more we understood that really the significance of the site derived from much more. Um, the Lion of Babylon was obviously something that many people study in art history. This tomb of um, Imman Ali's son is a 19th century prophet. It is the most visited part of the site. So today, while Babylon before the war was the most visited site in the country and school groups went and it was an educational resource, today, while people do come to the site and they come to take a walk along the Euphrates because it's a beautiful, picturesque site, the absolute most visited part of the site is this tomb. And so this is an issue for how the State Board of Antiquities will interpret the site one day. 
Much has been in the news on and off about Saddam Hussein's former palace that sits right adjacent to the site. Um, and people say, oh, it could be a museum, it could be a hotel, it could be a casino, it could be a visitor center. It is so vast, it could be all of those things, and there still would be more room. So that is also a conundrum for the State Board of Antiquities, particularly because the Babel government, which is the local provincial authority, they often come along and say that that belongs to them, not the State Board of Antiquities. So there's a little bit of a turf war going on because there is a sense that that could be a money-making property one day. So um, the State Board of Antiquities people, you know, we would talk to them regularly about what happens on the periphery of the site, and they pretty much would say, you know, we don't go to the periphery of the site. And I think one of the realizations we had midway through the um, management planning process was that there are archaeological, um, uh, our agricultural communities that ring the site, and they've been there forever. So Babylon, the archaeological zone, might have been abandoned, but people never stopped living along the stretch of the Euphrates. And so one of the things, Jeff Allen, who's wearing the white hat and the very tall person in the blue shirt, who's our person who goes to Iraq very regularly, I mean, one of the things he began to do was to try and reach out to these communities because people graze their animals uh, within the archaeological zone, People live within the archaeological zone, um, and people grow dates. And so there's really, part of the management plan had to address how do you accommodate local need and still protect the site. So that led up to um, how we ended up in Erbil. And because Bill and Angela are here and resources for you regularly, um, I'm sure they'll have opportunities to tell you about their experiences. But the entire experience of working in Iraq led to a desire on the part of the US government and the State Board of Antiquities to turn the Babylon experience into a training opportunity for other Iraqi professionals. And the idea originally had been to use Babylon as a kind of open classroom. But as the security situation deteriorated in Iraq, that really became um, an impossibility. And the US government had set up this Iraqi Institute for um, Conservation and Heritage in Erbil. And so we moved everything to Erbil, but um, a mandate from the US government had been that we run the training program with a US academic partner. And that was how we reached out to a variety of people across the country. And UT San Antonio and Bill and Angela specifically really turned out to be the ideal partners for us. So we ran the program last year for the first time, and uh, people came and went from the program. So on balance, I think that we had about 16 people overall, and I guess probably eight or nine who really participated in the whole program. In addition to Bill and Angela, we invited a lot of heritage professionals from the region. So uh, Anna Paulini, who was then head of the UNESCO office in Amman and had had a lot of experiences in the Middle East, came and spoke to the students. Um, we had archaeologists who'd worked in Lebanon and worked on conservation projects come and speak. Um, one of our staff members who had worked on the um, Erbil Citadel management plan, the most important heritage in Erbil, came and spoke about that experience. And so we had a very wide variety of people come, and the program really was so successful that we're doing it again in 2014. But the hope had really been that this would all translate eventually into opportunities for Iraqis to work on heritage sites. So, um, you know, we, um, we are still in our infancy, I guess, with the training program, but it really did grow out specifically from the notion that our Babylon site management plan and ultimate conservation projects on site should really be a springboard for a wider dialogue in the country. And, um, you know, I feel that one thing I can talk a little bit about, because Iraq was put on the World Monuments Watch List um, several years ago, and we put the entire country on at that time, because there was such fear in 2006 about what was happening with the looting. And this year, we announced the 2014 watch in uh, October 2013, and we put two countries on, Mali and Syria, because you know the threats seem to be growing in certain regions, and heritage is really caught in the crosshairs um, of political, 
and religious unrest. And so the watch, which started off as something that was really about singular monuments and their conservation needs, has really turned into a much broader point of departure for talking about what are the issues in heritage today. And sometimes it's the threat of uncontrolled development. Sometimes it's the threat of unmanaged tourism. And regrettably, in places like Iraq and Syria and Mali, it's really become the issue of will these sites survive a certain kind of political and social unrest. So um, we never know how much we're going to be able to help any of the um, sites on the watch. On balance, we've probably helped about 40% of the sites that have been on since we started it in 1996. Um, we've raised a total um, or leveraged from others of about $90 million that have gone for the 700 sites that have been on the watch. And, um, and uh, you know, it's a program that continues and it's, you know, hopefully a call to action. So I thought I could talk a little bit about a few success stories and a little bit about some of the sites we have aspirations for this time. So um, this, I picked this one, honestly, just because it's one of my favorite sites. So it has no, no, nothing, this isn't more special than any of the others. But in 1996, we had the very first watch site, or watch list, and um, the Temple of Hercules in Rome was on that watch. And, um, and it was on the watch because extraordinary as it could be that in a city like Rome, where Roman citizens and Roman visitors love the heritage of this city, that there could be um, you know, a temple that was one of the last remaining um, Republican era temples in Rome that could have fallen into such a dilapidated state. And it was also very orphaned because a major uh, road runs right adjacent to it. And it is a little death defying to get across those six lanes of traffic. But right across the street is um, the church where a uh, sculpture called the Boca della Verita is. And people put their hand in the mouth of the lion, you know, to see if they're telling the truth or if good luck will come to them. It's immortalized in uh, the movie Roman Holiday. Um, and yet here was this temple right across the street just languishing. And so World Monuments Fund secured uh, funding from American Express to pay for the entire restoration of this temple. And here's what it looks like now. All of that work was done in time for 2000, for Jubilee year. This is a picture I took two summers ago. And the most extraordinary thing about this project was it led the Roman authorities to say, well, now the Temple of Fortunus that's right next to it looks a little shabby. I think it should get fixed up too. And so we actually put that on the 2004 World Monuments Watch and um, ultimately secured funding from a variety of donors. And, but we said to the Roman authorities, we're only gonna help you restore this temple if you do something about recapturing this landscape. And so the reason I took this picture in this particular way is because um, I don't know if everybody can see on what would be everybody's right, there's a staircase that goes up. So that is a staircase that takes you up to where the river is because this was one of the most important markets in antiquity in Rome. And it's not just that this Temple of Hercules survives, but it's a reminder that the river is there. And without that staircase, there's no reason for anybody to go and explore. So this had become not only dilapidated, but divorced from its own history. And now they've put in you know, these nice pathways and some benches, and people really go and sit there now. And the, other, the Temple of Portunus is almost complete probably another year and it'll be finalized. But it's recaptured the imagination of many scholars. And at Angela's own university, people were working on a small book that we produced called the Forum Borarium. And it's all about the experience of how much actually remains of the Forum if you go and look for it. And so, you know, it's a success story because it really had a catalytic effect not just of restoring the temple and its neighbor, but really of reminding people that if you make it attractive and give people a little in information, they'll enjoy it. So um, Venice, which I talked about as being one of our earliest encounters with heritage activities, and you know, here's one of the most serene views of the Grand Canal. Um, and here's what it looks like if you're 
wondering how people deal with cruise ships in Venice. And so this time we put Venice on the watch, not because there shouldn't be cruise ships, but because there are now 1,500 cruise ships a year. And when this many cruise ships um, are in dock, there can be about 40,000 people getting off the cruise ships in one day. The population of Venice is about 45,000 people. So, you know, this is not to say that cruise ship tourism is a bad thing, but it means that people aren't staying in hotels and aren't eating in restaurants, and they're potentially doubling the population for a few hours a day. And it really has become a staggering problem that the ships have gotten bigger and bigger. And this is what it looks like. If you have the misfortune, when I took my mother to Venice for the first time, and we were walking, and all of a sudden this wall of people came towards us. And I you know, must say I literally feared for my mother's life because I thought, well, where do we go? And you know, we just kind of turned a corner to get out of the crowd. And, um, and, you know, and then you look at this picture and you think, well, how happy do these people look in this picture? And are they really enjoying Venice? And, um, and you know, why, why is this the only um, tourism solution? And if you think I'm exaggerating about the scale of the ships, um, this is not even the biggest ship that comes into port in Venice now. And so when four of these come by um, and then dock, um, you know, just off Piazza San Marco, you think to yourself, well, people have been coming to Venice on boats forever. I mean, that's how you got there before we had planes or trains. But, you know, we now have a scale that nobody could imagine when they first allowed the berthing of those ships there. So, you know, there is now proposals to move them to an industrial port that would only be a five-minute train ride into the heart of Venice, but there's obviously a lot of controversy because people want them to be right here. But, you know, what is the sustainability of that kind of tourism? And so, you know, that's why things come to us on the watch. And, you know, just again, a little scale, <laughs> and, um, and just a sense of, you know, why we would put something like this on the watch. So um, I wanted to leave on a happier note, though, and I also wanted to bring us back to Iraq. Um, and to say that, you know, one of the reasons we're willing to go and work in places like Cambodia in 1989 or Iraq in 2006 and develop this kind of training program is because I really do believe that heritage is something important to all of us. And it's not just a selected group of people who, you know, appreciated only for aesthetic reasons, but how much would be lost if we couldn't visit places and experience them. And this is um, the group on one of their site visits um, last summer. And, um, and I think that, you know, we're not, you know, smarter people or more passionate people um, or more compassionate people than any other people who work in the field. But I do think that we really believe strongly that the more we can teach people the concepts of heritage and the more we can tie this to everyday activities, the more opportunities there are to learn from each other. And I really think that the partnership with University of Texas San Antonio and with the Urbiel Institute is really just that kind of meeting and gathering point that you know, we all become, in a way, um, sort of heritage apostles. And it's an opportunity to share what we know and learn from each other. And I certainly um, have learned a lot um, from my opportunities to work with Bill and Angela on other projects. And I'm very happy that they're working with us again in 2014. Thank you. So uh, we've allowed for some time for questions at the end, and actually what uh, I've envisioned is that uh, some of the questions will probably be about the work that was conducted uh, in Iraq. And so if Angela uh, can come up and have a seat here, the three of us can uh, hopefully answer anything. But first, if there's specific questions about the World Monuments Fund uh, mission, uh, or any of the programs that Lisa just mentioned, uh, we should entertain those first, and Lisa would be uh, happy to answer them. Yes, please. Here. Well, you know, yes, I do. 
do, but um, fortunately, I have great partners in the field who send me photos like this image where um, you know, the group all went to see the monuments men uh, in Iraq. And, um, and Angela um, was part of the group. There she is with blue scarf. And, um, and I think, you know, I do. I have lots of days where I think, oh my God, there must be something easier to do. And, um, but then I really am reminded constantly of what great partners I have in the field, so. Well, um, we were um, part of a group of people who um, set up that workshop and we funded that for a time. And then we secured some money to work on a couple of houses in the Holy Cross neighborhood. And then we were asked to restore one of the tombs in um, the Lafayette Cemetery. And then really by that point, Preservation Resource Center in New Orleans and the National Trust were doing so much work as were other groups, and we, we really um, kind of concluded our work with the Taylor tomb in the cemetery, and then just kind of felt other people were better positioned locally than we were. So I guess we finished all of our work in New Orleans in um, 2010. There, there is another group that still is working in New Orleans, and there's probably more, but one that I've worked with with UTSA students is called Historic Green. And so if anybody's looking for ways to get engaged with volunteer opportunities or to get connected, there's a lot of them and I'd be happy to help you with that because there's still rebuilding going on. So, more questions? Yeah. So the, the question concerns the use of World Heritage Sites once they're inscribed on the list. Um, and this question could apply to any heritage site uh, in terms of how is it used by the traditional users, um, which in this case might be you know, churchgoers uh, coming to worship in the sacred spaces, uh, and uh, that could potentially include or be in conflict with tourism programs and what's the future of that. So. Um, I expanded a little bit more broadly because you may not know, you know, specifically what's going on with our missions, um, but it, but it's a topic of concern. So in terms of that long-term use, do you want to? Sure. Um, or I can I can stand. Maybe that's easier. Um, so the World Heritage inscription um, doesn't affect the usage of anything. There is no World Heritage inscription edict that could ever be as strong as any local preservation ordinance. So, I mean, you have to sort of think of it as a pyramid. So there's a local designation. You could be on the state register. In the United States, you could be on the national register. Um, and then you could have World Heritage inscription. Basically, what the World Heritage inscription says is, this is a place of outstanding universal value and you know, we should all embrace it as part of our shared cultural heritage. And there are certain things about you have to maintain the buildings in good standing, but the churches of Lalibela were inscribed on the World Heritage List a long time ago and it has absolutely no effect on how um, the priests run the churches. And it, they don't even have to allow tourists in if they didn't want to. And in fact, on certain holy days of the year, the priests in Ethiopia do not allow tourists in. And then there's certain parts of the churches where tourists can never go. And that does not affect its World Heritage status at all. The only time the World Heritage Center puts something on the World Heritage in danger list has rarely has anything to do with usage. It usually just has to do with either very, very bad tourism management um, or you know, outright 
full and lasting neglect of a place. Um, but there are a lot of World Heritage sites that are active religious centers. I would just want to add to that that um, the use of a, of a heritage site can be critically important to its authenticity and its meaning and its value. So in the example of a religious worship space, a church, a, a church isn't really a church without churchgoers. It's just a building. And so uh, the authenticity of the San Antonio missions relies very heavily upon the continued use of the people who are using it now, uh, which includes the people that live in the communities surrounding uh, each of the missions. Um, and that's why the nomination is written about the cultural landscape that includes the people living in that landscape. And it's not just about the architecture of the buildings. So it's an important distinction and something that's key to the perpetuation of its outstanding universal value. Because if that use were to go away, its value would diminish. Want to add anything? No. All right. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Why don't we do it this way, and I'll just give you the microphone. <laughs> I don't have to repeat the question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there were um, the, all these people at Angkor Wat that are um, working for World Monument, um, Monument Fund now. And so I'm, my question is two part. How many people do you actually employ to carry out these projects? And then the second part is, um, are you having to fundraise for every project, or are you endowed at this point? Because with that many projects and that many people working, it sounds expensive. Uh, I think World Monuments Fund employees pray every day for an endowment to arrive. But um, we actually have a very small endowment um, by you know, nonprofit standards, our endowment's about $30 million. And um, we raise 15 to $20 million a year for all of our projects. So in fact, um, the endowment that we have is certainly useful, but it, um, it largely does not cover any of our um, regular activities. So, um, you know, we, we take on projects and fundraise simultaneously. Um, and then, you know, we have a very small group of very loyal donors who fortunately um, have given at significant levels. And so, um, you know, we hope that that pool always expands. In Cambodia, from 1989 to now, um, we've raised about $13 million for the work we've done at four temples. Um, and we, right now, employ about 140 Cambodians. Um, our current coordinator there, who's really an administrator for us, happens to be um, an Italian professional uh, who was living in Cambodia and we hired. And, um, and then we have maybe five American consultants who go periodically to assist with certain aspects of the work. But, um, you know, basically, um, the program is something that uh, we intend to run until about 2017, so we probably, in that particular instance, need to raise probably another $3 million to conclude all of our work. So, you know, it's a constant balancing act of um, raising money, um, trying to do what we can, and then sometimes we don't care whether we do it like with the watch. A lot of it is inspiring other people to give. So, for instance, the Japanese ambassador to Guatemala read about a site on the watch several years ago, and he got the Japanese government to give money for that project. And we had a similar um, experience um, in Burkina Faso, where a Dutch uh, a diplomat read about the watch list, saw that the site in Burkina Faso was on, and so you know he went and secured the money. So a lot of times what we hope we're doing is inspiring others um, to give as well. I was in Priya Khan in 1994, and as we walked in, there were two little signs. One said, don't step off the path because of the mines. But the other one said that this uh, Priya Khan was being restored by World Monuments Fund, UNESCO, and Nancy Negley, yeah. who's from here. That is true. <laughs> uh, yes, Nancy Negley and the Brown Foundation um, have been extraordinary donors to our work. Um, they've helped 
a lot in Cambodia. They also uh, funded uh, our project uh, at the Chunlong Garden in Beijing. And then they, Nancy herself was the catalyst for us taking on a project of the Roman site of Bularegia in Tunisia. And I mean, I can honestly say if it were not for the Brown Foundation, that project would not exist. So um, we're grateful <laughs> to that. And so, yeah, um, that sign is long gone, unfortunately, but inside the Freya Khan Visitor Center, there's um, a donor um, honor roll of everybody who's given, which in that case is probably about 40 people who've helped us over the years. So. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, surveying cultural resources seems to be a critical step in preserving of these historic resources. Uh, I have read that the WMF and the Getty Institute have paired to create an open source software arches um, for local preservationists to use to create, to do these surveys. Um, I and my classmates have finished surveying a neighborhood in a very old school paper pen kind of way, and then going back and entering into the, uh, into the computer. Has there been any, I mean, I know it's kind of new, but has there been any local groups that have met with success in yeah. putting their forms or their uh, surveys on that particular technological platform? Oh dear, so um, it's an excellent question. So Arches, which is the open source GIS based software that we created, started as an aspect of our work in Iraq. So um, in the early 2000s when there was this great concern for all of the looting that was happening, the State Board of Antiquities really didn't know what to do because they essentially had no national inventory of the heritage site. So they had a variety of inventories that had been done that were literally on cards um, in the offices in the Baghdad Museum. So, you know, not only were they out of date in many instances, they were inaccessible. Um, so the State Board of Antiquities personnel had little they could do to say whether a certain hole had been at the site before or not and could they prove that it was new looting. So we um, started a project that um, was meant to survey in Iraq and then Iraq just became more and more unstable and it was impossible to do the survey work. So we moved the project to Jordan and, um, and it was then called uh, Mega Jordan, Middle Eastern Database for Antiquities. And it's fully deployed in Jordan. And it's been fully deployed in Jordan for a couple of years. And what happened was more and more people kept asking us if we could design, you know, mega wherever. And, um, and you know, we thought, well, we really can't go into the software development business. And we had brought the Getty in as a partner um, when we moved the whole project to Jordan. And, um, and we've been working extremely closely with the Getty Conservation Institute ever since, and they've really taken a leadership role in the last couple of years in really turning it into what is now Arches. And so um, it's now at this point where many groups are now starting to think about using it, and we were just at, um, told that we're gonna be part of Google's Summer of Code, which we hope will get it to the next level where people can really deploy it. I mean, it's usable the way it is now, but it probably, at this stage, still requires individual customization by whoever might adopt it. So, um, I mean, I think we're getting closer to being able to say, yes, here are the four people out there using it effectively, but we're not quite there yet. So, um, this is the project that keeps me up at night. <laughs> oh. Well, that's shocking, and I'll add to that that I'm working with my seminar class, and we're trying to use Arches to do some inventory work. So, if you want to talk to some of the students yeah. who've been trying to use it and get some feedback, uh, one of the principal ones is is here tonight who has that task, and the other ones who are engaged in related tasks are also working on it. That was a great question. It's a software that holds a tremendous amount of promise, and so we're all in the field hoping that <laughs> it's going to work. Me too. So. Well, let's thank Lisa again for coming to visit us.
I, I have a, a little gift I want to present to you, Lisa. Here you go. And it's a, a book of one of our famous architects uh, from San Antonio, O'Neill Ford. And this is a book about his work uh, in San Antonio. You've seen some of it today on our tour, and maybe oh, yeah. we'll see a little bit of it tomorrow. So uh, thank you very much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure.